What is up? Welcome to this week's episode of Lamb Goat's Van Flip Podcast. This week I am joined by vocalist James of the band Ringworm, who has been around for a long time, since the late 80s. They had a brief a brief stint off uh, a hiatus for a short period of time in the 90s, but then since 99 have been back full-fledged, uh, killing it. And um, James, welcome to the show. You're not the first person from Ring- Ringworm that I've had on the show. I did have Frank from Integrity and Hatebreed and Ringworm as well on the show yeah. uh, about a year or so ago. So welcome welcome to the Van Flip, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, what's been going on in your uh, in your day to day? I know you guys have a you released a new song a couple weeks ago, and you have a new album coming out next week. Uh, this podcast will the, the album will be out by the time this podcast comes out. But August eighteenth, you have the, your uh, your latest album is dropping. Yeah, um, we're pretty stoked on it. You know, um, pretty excited for everybody to hear it. I mean, uh, you know, we've been doing this for a while, so we're kind of. Uh, you know, when a new when we're ready to launch a new record, we kind of, you know, it's almost a relief sometimes because records take so long to come out. You know, so it's yeah. like we've been we recorded this record, you know, over a year ago. So it's like just the waiting is it's almost a relief when it comes out. You know, yep, hundred. It's more it's more relief. To, I mean, we're excited about it, but it's almost just a relief to finally get the product out. Yeah, like most of the, I don't want to say hard work, but most of the diligent work is done, and now you can kind of go out and play it live, or you know, not have that he- uh, that on your back or on your conscience about having to wrap that yeah, whole process. Yeah, that's up. the idea, you know. But like once the record gets out, and we can finally take it on the road. Is that the plan? Uh, would you have any, do yeah. you have anything lined up currently? I know yeah, I don't think got, um, um, as I'm speaking here today and uh, this this weekend, we've got a show here in Cleveland hmm. with. Uh, couple death metal bands a classic band called deceased mm-hmm. um another band here from cleveland area nun slaughter cool so we're doing that and then a couple of days later we kind of flipped the script a little bit and we head up to detroit and play with sick of it all and life of agony oh nice you're gonna you had yeah, so we're yeah. kind of we're kind of checking all our boxes when it comes to this stuff so and then after that um in late september we go out for three weeks with um venom inc and uh old school british band uh satan oh yeah cool yeah that's definitely a a, a trek and uh that should be fun uh with the like for vagony 30 year that's i remember it's on the river runs through uh river runs red uh yeah. celebration i would assume yeah so that's that's gonna be a fun time um, i think so it's a it's you know it's um uh, we got hit up about doing that one a couple of months ago and we're like sure that'd be fine <laughs> yeah should be fun. um so this is this Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is your first Nuclear Blast record, right? It is. It's your ninth yeah. record overall, but your first with Nuclear Blast. How did that come into fruition? Well, it's kind of a strange... Not, I don't know if it's a strange story, but, um, you know, like any other band, the the, the lockdown and the shutdown mm-hmm. stuff for a couple of years really took a toll on a lot of bands. A lot of bands didn't come back from it. You know, a lot of, a lot of musicians couldn't get back into it after that because taking yep. two years off is devastating to to bands you know mm-hmm. and to not only to band like musicians but to like drivers and roadies and merch people and caterers and lighting guys and sound guys and managers you know when you have two years off you have to do something to make a living so sometimes there's a lot of people that just never came back to the music scene because they went out and got a quote-unquote you know real job yeah you know something more advantageous but, um, for us it was a little tricky too but i mean we're in a position we've always been in a position where we don't we don't do this for a living for you know what i mean it's not our bread and butter i mean we do it as much as we can which is quite a bit and we never really seem to slow down but we don't do it for a living so um it didn't really affect us on that front like on financial front you know yeah as a matter of fact we probably all made more money (laughs) not doing the band you know but um so so we were after we finished our uh contract with relapse because we put out three records with, mm-hmm. with, with relapse and um they had an option for a fourth but at the time they decided to pass on it and we were fine with that because we had a nice you know three run three record run with them and we had you know uh they treated us good and they were really cool and but they wanted to pass on this one so we're like okay um so at the time we didn't have we didn't have a label we didn't have any type of management we didn't have 
a booking agent. We didn't have anything really. We had a Facebook page of 40, 50,000 people that got hacked mm. and then we had nothing there. Wow. So we had nothing really. So we except, you know, just the desire to still play music, you know, like yeah. let's fucking write a record. So uh, during all that time, Matt was always writing because he's always writing. So by the time we got into the studio, um, we were under the assumption that we were just going to say, you know what, fuck it. We're just going to put this out ourselves. I mean, why not? You yeah. know, it's like we've been in this business long enough. We know how to do it. It's a lot of work. But, you know, we're like, well, you know, we'll just do it ourselves. So we went in there, did the record. And um, we went this time we went with um, for, for the entire recording. We went to uh, Mercenary Studios with uh, Noah Buchanan and he had recorded the previous record just the music and it was um mixed by young out on the west coast and um i did my vocals separately taylor young did, sorry you know, no, 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 what's no. that you said young was it taylor young that did the yeah. uh, okay just making sure yeah Very fine. so he, he did yeah he did the mix on that and we we're real happy with that but you know what when we came in to do this next one noah's like you know what guys let me let me just have a crack at this whole thing you know, he's like, I got a good vision for how I want this, how this could sound. And we were totally cool with that. So um, plus it just kind of worked timing wise and how chaotic the world was when this was all going down. And we kept everything in house. and It was great. Yeah. So um, we went in there, recorded the record with the intentions of putting it out ourselves. And uh, when we were done, Noah was kind of like, guys, he's like, you know what? He's like, this is a pretty fucking good record. He's like you guys should really consider, you know, giving it the old college try and seeing if someone wants to put this out. So, you know, we all like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. You know? So, um, I hit up a few friends of mine and I uh, said, Hey, you know, some people want you to put this in front of someone's face and see what they think. And right away, nuclear blast jumped at it and they're like, yeah, let's do it. And we're like, okay, let's do it. Yeah. So we were able to give them a finished product, everything done, ready to, ready to rock and ready to go. So, I'm sure they like that. Yeah, of course. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Um, so since then, it's been like pedal to metal with them. So nice. And uh, it's time for it to come out. So that's the abbreviated story about how that happened. <laughs> yeah, the shorthand. That's fine. Uh, would this be like a one one off kind of deal or is there like no, I mean, a possibility if, if, to do if more? This, if this one does well and they want to do another one where, you know, cool, we'll do that. Um, of course, if, you know, the, sometimes the larger the label, the, the bigger the expectations are right. for, for a band. You know, you could, there's some labels and some bands that if they sell 200,000 records, that's a failure. Mm, you know what yeah. I mean? And we're not one of those bands, obviously, that's going to do something like that. I mean, that'd be awesome, but, you know, so we'll see how they feel. I mean, either way, it's it's a good opportunity for us. It's a large label, great great uh, overseas where we've kind of been lacking because we really want to get back over there. So it's a win-win for everybody, you know, if it, you know, if, if they feel like they don't want to do another one, that's okay. You know, they, we did one with them and it got our, you know, got us out there a bit more. And mm -hmm. if they want to do another one, then that's good news, you know? Yeah. And uh, I would assume everything leading up to getting with nuclear blast is all self-financed. Like you guys, Pay for the oh, recording, yeah. pay for the mastering, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah it makes sense yeah, that I mean, a regular they would want to pick that up. But they don't have to spend no, I mean, much money. We, we did everything. We, like I said, we were had the intentions of doing it ourselves. And uh, I mean, uh, the past almost all of our record covers, I've drawn those, and I did all the layouts and the drawings and the album cover. And you know, we had it. We paid for everything. So by the time you know it was ready to, it was all done. Like I said, we. We were able to, to uh, shop a completely 100% finished product to, to mm. people, so um, to, to label. So that I'm sure that was quite attractive for a, anyone that wants. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course, really of course. So, um, but uh, yeah. So we, it was all pretty much all self financed. Nice. Uh, was there? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the. Okay, so when when you do approach like a record label, I don't want to say Nuclear Blast specifically, but like, so let's say a record label wants to put that record out that you've already self-financed, like, how much more beneficial is that for like the artist or the band themselves when it comes to a kind of like, 
you know, splits and working with the label and this, that, well, and the other. I, you, you, you kind of have a, a leg up somewhat because you're not really dealing with any advances or having to recoup any type of any finance that, you know, you don't have to, you know, they don't give you a large advance because everything's already done that they'd right. be paying for. So, so right there, that's less money you actually have to pay back to a label. Like, you know, you don't, there's not, not a lot of recoupable stuff and there's no art fees because the art's done and, and all that shit. So it, it, you start in a pretty good place actually, because, you know, for, for a band, um, um, I'm sorry, I got a text here. No, you're good. <laughs> um, God damn it. Leave me alone. Fuckers. Um, Okay. Oh, sorry about that. But uh, as a band, yeah, you're going into it in a, in a pretty good situation. So I, as I was saying, it's kind of a win-win. I mean, you, you, you know, on your end, you're gaining a lot from, you know, I guess the exposure and, and the, the uh, social um, railroad that larger labels have to get your stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're benefiting because they don't have to put much money in. So um, it's a win. It really is a win-win for everybody on yeah. both sides because yeah. if the record tanks well they didn't spend any money right. and neither did we but we got to put a record out that everybody got to listen to you know more people got to listen to so and it may tank now but catch on later on like a cult classic you never know yeah Things well do that's, take time that's awesome in a nutshell a cult classic right <laughs> yeah you only got to be around for 35 years and then you become classic or yeah, legend. There you go. that's you're... another one you're legend you're legends man okay yeah let yeah, the legendary sure. band ringworm is tossed around uh -huh. sometimes too yeah sure. um so yeah not to harp on that specific topic but um was that would that be something that you do again like self-finance it again through new, well, like working with nuclear blast or what are no, the differences I don't, know. Like, I don't know um we're just gonna take one record at a time okay but um i mean we we even when we were working with labels and they supply you know they give you your advanced to record and stuff like that it never really put much pressure on us too much to i guess oh, okay well we got to pay this back or this that and the other because honestly there's not much money to be made in record sales i True. mean at least coming from where i've come from it's like you don't make a lot of money in record sales so you know um you get that by going on the road selling t-shirts doing that type of shit. Mm -hmm. um so as far as moving into another record if it's with nuclear blast or someone else we'd have to kind of you know see where we're at at yeah. that point you know um sometimes there's you know a little more a couple more perks maybe like you know different studio options or recording studio yeah, options or I different mean, well, producers what, i mean we're also a simple animal and we really we, we really love the way that this one turned out um noah buchanan who who did this one for us um I, I, won't, I don't say that he pre, he didn't really produce it. I mean, we produced it, but his engineering skills and the way that he was able to get these guitars to sound and the mix that he put on everything, it just um, it brings everything up just a notch from all of our other records. Not that I don't like those or I don't think they sound good, but he just got a little something out of us and made this one sound just extraordinarily more vicious. You know, it's it's dirty and it's heavy, but it's not muddy. The mix, you could hear everything pretty crystal clear in it. And it's just it, the, the, the level of aggression is, uh, you know, we kind of, I guess, one upped it, one upped it from the last record, I think, just yeah. by the sheer production alone, you okay. know? Yeah. That, so I was going to ask, I mean, typic, in my typical questioning of like, you know, bands when they have new albums out, you know, you, you definitely huh? want to ask, like, what sets this one apart from the last one? So, what sets seeing through fire apart from like death becomes my voice or the previous ones outside of just the engineering and stuff like that as well yeah i mean focus. well you know for a band like us that's been around we always consider ourselves and we always wrote songs as we're kind of more of a hybrid band i mean even yeah. when we first started we had elements of grind elements of thrash elements of kind of hardcore elements yeah. of just straight up kind of thrash metal we've always brought that it's baked into our cake right it's baked into our dna and certain certain records um have different percentages of each of those influences some records are a little bit more metal some are a little bit more hardcore some have a lot more punk influence to them but it's, it's all in there it's all represented in all of our records some more than others you know 
And this one, I think we, we, I know, like I said, we brought it back to like the roots because that's kind of makes your eyes roll. But <laughs> this one, we kind of, um, I think all of the, all of our influences and elements that we've always brought into our music mm -hmm. are pretty well represented on this one, all evenly across the board because, uh, and that's what we did early on. So we kind of had a little bit of everything. And this one is, well, all of them have a little bit of everything, but this one, they're all pretty evenly matched, you know, as far yeah. as like having some more hardcore stuff in there and then some thrash and then some grindcore and then some, you know, some straight up metal. And then we've got, and that's all delivered in a punk rock fashion. You know what I mean? So it's like, they're all equally represented on this new record. So, and then you add that into um, the production of the whole thing that is, has a fresh feel to it too. Mm -hmm. And then you add in a, a brand new label, which gives you kind of, you know, uh, a, a feels like you're, you're energized by that. And then uh, on top of that, if, if with this one, I kind of went a different direction with the artwork. So in a lot of ways, it's a whole, it's, I don't want to say a rebirth because we've been around forever, but with, <laughs> with, with this record, it's, it's everything. We tried to do stuff that we didn't do usually, you know, like yeah. we recorded a couple of videos and, and a new one's going to be coming out soon, but usually, um, and this was also a matter of time, but usually I'm really, um, hands on with those. I do a lot of pre-production for those. I do storyboards for a lot of them. And this time because of, either time conflictions or everything else. Um, I went out and uh, worked with this production uh, team called The Coin, and I kind of was had a hands-off approach, which mm. was difficult for me because yeah. I'm kind of a complete freak. But I'm um, really happy with the way that came. I mean, we worked on it together. We bounced ideas. But at a certain point, I was kind of hands-off and let them do their thing, which is unusual, you know? So there's a lot of different things about this that, this this whole new record that we've done differently or stuff that we just didn't do you know what i mean like you know like letting letting people um help a little bit more than we're used to yeah you know because we've always been a even though we've been on labels we've always felt that we're a diy band because we don't really have that that built-in you know mechanism of you know everyone's gonna help us out you know yeah. we just always have to kind of do our own thing and hope for the best so yeah um, yeah so there's there's a big there's a fresh feeling about this new record that um all those things bring to the table yeah plus it was a longer period of time than normally that you you guys have between albums i mean well yeah, granted, I there's, mean, like there's the whole pandemic and, you know, and shit that happened but yeah that really screwed to, and even like with with relapse, it's like, you know, when things started opening up, you know, they could have been like, yeah, we'll put your record out. But, you know, people didn't stop making music. Right. They just stopped putting it out. So when everything opened up, these labels were slammed with like two years worth of releases to put out. Mm -hmm. And then you had all the backlog at the pressing plants and all this stuff. So it's like, okay, we'll put your record out, but it ain't going to come out till 2024, you know, and we're just like, we're 50 years old, man. We've got to get this record out now. So that's why it was, you know, obviously they passed on it, but we're like, okay, well then the quickest way to get this record out would be to just do it ourselves and cut through all the record label bullshit and yeah. just put the record out. And we just assumed that people that like us, were going to buy it anyways. So they like what we do and they're going to buy it, so, which was fine with us. But then with the nuclear blast coming to the table, then we're like, all right, <laughs> Let's do that instead. That's yeah. probably a lot better than doing it ourselves. So yeah. Do you guys normally? I mean, obviously, you normally stay to that frequency of releasing like t five or t five or six albums in a ten-year span. Uh, now that you guys have had a little bit of a breather within you know nineteen to, to this year, two thousand nineteen to this year, uh, do you guys want to re you know go back to the every year, two years making a release, or do you want to? That's wait? probably what it'll be. I okay. mean. I mean, you know, we, we're realistic about things. We're old dudes. I mean, but we still bring it as hard as any of these young kids. So it's like, you death, definitely, you know, you know, it, it's, we have to be realistic sometimes and be like, and usually every record, me and Matt kind of look at each other after 
you know, after a certain period of period of time, we kind of look at each other like, well, I'm like, what do you think? You know, do you want to do another record? You know what I mean? Because this stuff isn't easy to do. Of course not. You know, it's not easy, especially when you get out and tour and you have grown up responsibilities and all that shit. You got to look at each other and be like, hey, man, what what are we willing to do? What are we all able to do at this point? You know, none of us can get up and go and be on the road for six months out of the year. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. So we kind of look at each other and we're, the answer is always yes, because we just love doing it. You know, so Matt's like, well, yes, because I already wrote the other record. You're like, okay, well, I guess we're going to have another record. So and are, are you saying started. there's another record in the mix already? Probably. Okay. Probably Matt is a, Matt is a writing machine. Not alone for Ringworm, but he's also in a band called um, uh, Shed the Skin, which is like a 90s death metal band. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where the scene there, he came from originally, and they came up in that scene. And they're very good. And they have three records out, and I think a, they, have, they have four records out, and a fifth one on the way. And then he does another band called Rip Ride, and that's their second record's coming out. And they're kind of like a Dokken 80s style metal band, okay, okay. really good. He just continuously writes, so I have no doubt that he probably has more Ringworm songs already. Oh, interesting. So, interesting. Yeah, so he he's he's just a writing machine. So, you know, we kind of uh, just assume that we're just going to keep doing it until someone drops dead, probably. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> mean to laugh, but the you know just the way you put it, it's uh, very hey, uh, you know was... whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, but, but we still like don't agree. we we like it because we love doing it. You know. Yeah. Like, we're lifers. It's hard to think of it just being sitting at home and not making music. It's just a weird yeah. foreign concept to me. And for me, it's always been very therapeutic. I mean, from the get-go, I get to scream and yell my balls off about all sorts of shit. And so not too many people have that that release, you know, like that. Yeah, that and if people do it, it in public, it. it's usually not and a good sometimes thing. Sometimes they even actually give you money for it, and they yeah. like it. I don't Whatever. Yeah. Um, we're weird. <laughs> yeah. How, I mean, speaking of like, you know, writing re the record and everything like that, like you guys have been around for so long, put so many records out. Like, I know you just kind of, you know, give, get, shed a little light on like, it's easy for Matt to like, just crank out riffs and stuff like that. But it like, how is it at this particular point with a discography as long and as deep as you guys have, like, how is it difficult to write a new record? Um, not for him. Like you said, Matt, <laughs> Matt not for Matt. Um, it's the riff machine. For right? me, it's challenging a little bit because, you know, if you're an outsider and you look at the type of music we do, you could you could easily say they all the songs sound the same. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For the untrained ear. For sure. Everything sounds the same. It's the same tempo, same kind of beats, which is true, probably, but that's for an outsider looking in on it. You know, you right. can say that with almost any genre. Exactly. But, I was going to say that. But, um, you know, for me, it's, it gets challenging because you don't want to, you don't really necessarily want to repeat yourself lyrically as far as like the cadences. You, you basically, it's like a puzzle kind of, you, I, I'll hear a song and I start putting, um, I guess, patterns, vocal patterns mm -hmm. together. And that's kind of like a trick. It's like a puzzle trying to figure out how to do, how to sing differently over the same tempo for, 30 years yeah you know, and that becomes challenging now like lyrically that's not too challenging because i'm just, you know all your topics that you sing about are the same as you know you what do you what's anyone saying about they're saying about life death love loss things, you know all, all the the main things that anyone ever sings about are there you know what i mean you see how you see the world how you see yourself all those things are still the same now your perspective of those things will change from the time you're 18 to the time you're 51. You know, some <laughs> of them should stay. Some of them, I still hate some of the same shit I did when I was 18. But a lot of stuff, you have different perspectives on on things, and the world changes around you, and you just kind of watch it go by. And you know, the world never ceases to give you tons of ammunition to True. Um, write about it. And you know, and 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 I'm pretty. I'm pretty um, in tune with the fact that I don't have much range. I mean, my vocal my vocal toolbox has like three hammers in it. You know, a large one, a sledgehammer, a regular hammer, and a ball peen hammer. Those that's my musical toolbox. Yeah. So, and I don't I don't you know 
for this, I don't really sing, you know what I mean? So that kind of narrows your, um, you know, no one wants to hear a love, like you can't really pull off like a nice love song with this type of music. The music no ballad, doesn't, no ringworm ballad in the, in the, yeah, uh, yeah the, the music chamber. doesn't allow it and neither does my vocal range. So <laughs> right there, you're, you know, right there, you're kind of like, well, this becomes an outlet for, you know, um, aggression you know it doesn't become an outlet for like peace and love it just doesn't uh it doesn't allow that you know what i mean so at least for my for my coming from where i'm coming from so but lyrically it, it's challenging but um once you get it's when you take a lot of time off from writing for me um things come slow when, it, when it's time to do a new record because matt will they'll record the whole record before i usually hear all the songs it's almost done Okay. And then I get those and I sit down with them and I just start pecking away at them. And the more I do it, sometimes it just starts coming like really easy. But you got to work your way into it, or at least I do. I mean, sometimes I feel like I got a total block. I'm like, I don't know. Like I've never written words before. <laughs> and then, you know, and then as I go, by, by the time I get two or three songs in, they everything just starts flowing. I'm like, boom, 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 boom. And, uh, you know, start going on. Um, just start writing and it's and it's strange too because a lot of the times if i do these things i'll ask what what a certain song's about and i may not know what it's about hmm. like i'm like i don't know it's just shit that i wrote down and i may not know what about what it's about until maybe two years later when i listen to it and i'll be like oh wait a minute that's what was going on now it makes sense to me what the hell those words meant interesting yeah, so interesting. it's it's a weird it's a weird thing sometimes but Overall, I just think about stuff that I think I know about or you know, the way I feel about how I see things. Because there's a lot of bands that will, you know, sing about how how hard they are, or how tough they are, and maybe they are, who knows, but that's not me. But sometimes I, I see bands doing that and I know them. I'm like, dude, you're not fucking what are you talking about, man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, you of course. You've never done that in your life. What are you talking about? Yeah. So that's okay. And that's okay too. It's just all, it's all good. But I uh, have a tendency to take things more per in a personal direction. I get that. I get so that. yeah, it, get, it gets, it gets tough to do that. And it's, and it's taxing too, because you've got to drive, especially when you write about stuff like that, those songs don't necessarily lose all their meaning the more times you play them. So sometimes you're singing a song that's 10, 15 years old and you've got to kind of dredge up old fucking bullshit yeah. that, in with them that you don't really want to anymore you put it behind you but you got to sing that song every night yeah that's always kinda... curious because I, I think about that too because i obviously like like you said things change from when you're 18 to whatever age later mm -hmm. in life and like are yep. there songs that like you guys have written maybe that lyrically you don't maybe align with the same views anymore and do you guys play those still or do you not play yeah, those anymore? yeah i mean look there's not anything that i've you know Plus, it's like, hey, I, 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 I've never really done anything, like wrote about stuff that I've that I've gone so far away from that I couldn't sing it anymore. Gotcha. You know? but it, it's also it's like sometimes you just gotta dredge up painful memories and sing about those yeah. all the time. In regular life, most people don't have to do that. Right. You have to, you can you <laughs> can like get abusive, get on with abusing life. yourself. You know. Yeah, you, yeah, you exactly. You know, you can get on with your life and be just fine and put stuff in the past, but sometimes you gotta think about it even if it's in the back of your mind you're thinking about it you know yeah. what i mean so that is something i think about a lot too when people are writing songs about either ones they've lost or relationship they're no longer in or you know traumatic sure. events and stuff like that like so since you clearly have experienced something along those lines in the long career uh, career in ringworm like a can you explain like how that feels in the moment while singing because obviously or by while screaming that that is um you know that you're probably there's got to be an internal battle of emotions with what's going on uh -huh. in reality. I mean, you know, you, but at the same time, you're also you're. Are you out of it a little bit because you're on stage and you're in that mode? Or yeah, you yeah you definitely. I mean, I do. I get locked in, and I'm. You'll find me a somewhat different person when we're playing a show, but mm. um. You know, it's it, it sometimes it's easy to just turn it off and on. And a lot of times you, you are, you're having a show, you're, you're entertaining people. So it's like, sometimes, you know, you do your best on some of the ones that really, really hit home just to, just to kind of 
focus that they're just words. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, you, you try to put that, you try to compartmentalize that shit, you know, and just be like, just play the song and you're good. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't try to dwell on it too much. And, uh, and then other times you kind of appreciate it too, because it reminds you of, of maybe of a, a somewhere you fucked up in life and not to do it again. You yeah. know what I mean? Or how far it's you've come from that moment. Songs are reminders of that too, you yeah. know? So you're like, okay, when you sing it all the time, it reminds you like, oh yeah, don't be an idiot. Mm. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, you mentioned earlier that you have some more uh, music videos coming out for the album and whatnot. Um, historically, you guys haven't really released a, a ton of music videos. I think uh, you've released one early, early, earlier for No Solace, No Quarter, No Mercy. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think, and, and you're, you would know more than I since you have, you're way more hands-on with all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys didn't release a video or two videos in a year except for 2016 and i think you have like outside of that a handful of videos overall right yeah i mean well one one's money i mean true okay we don't have the money to do it it's really hard to get things done and do it well um we did one for um our third album this is a little interesting story about that that maybe your listeners don't know mm. but this is a kind of a, a, a weird thing so we did we did a video for Justice Replaced by Revenge, and that did really well because at the time, our friend uh, Jamie Josta was doing Headbang in his ball. Yeah. So he was able to pull some strings and get a lot of his friends' bands on there, and that video got quite a quite a bit of play on Headbanger's Ball at the time. I mean, granted, it wasn't as huge as it once was when I was a kid, but it was still really fucking cool. It was the last stronghold for music videos on that thing almost. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're probably right there, you know? Um, so after that, let's see, we didn't do, we did one for, I think we did, I think we may have done one for almost every record. We did one for Used Up, Spit Out on uh, Scars. But then fast forward to, um, God, I'm going to be gonna put on the spot to try to remember all our fucking records. But, we, but about 15 years later, we did a video for um, Shades of Blue, which was off of uh, Snake Church. Snake Church. Now that record, now that video was a, a direct sequel to the um, Justice Replaced by Revenge video. Mm, interesting. So it's a story that we continue, we were able to continue like years later with the same same actress in it and stuff. And then fast forward to the next record, we did a song called Acquiesce uh, from our previous record just now. And those are those three videos are all in the same the same story being told over a 20 year period, kind of. I mean, they're supposed to be right next to each other, but we were able to kind of do that. So the idea at one point was to shoot a few extra pieces of footage to really link those videos together and make it one short little, I guess, little short movie. Mm -hmm. That idea is still there, but time's ticking on some of that stuff. But um, yeah. So that was a little interesting factoid about those videos. But we, we've done a few when we can. We did one for the Ninth Circle, which was pretty good. We had a relapse came off and uh, uh, gave us a, a decent amount to work with. And, of course, with all the videos, since I'm so hands-on, a lot a lot of the fucking work and pre-production I do for free. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I arrange stuff, and I'll put in my own money just to get these things made. And it's just, you know, um, I like doing them. I hate... I like producing them and making them and you know I, when you do them anyone that's done a music video before it's very tiring and it's you feel like an idiot because you got to lip sync the same song for 30 times in a row you know yeah. so you kind of feel like a dork that's something but, that people probably don't realize you have to actually yeah, lip sync I mean, it <laughs> you know it's like, you just gotta and, and honestly pretending like you're singing a song is more tiring than actually doing it because you've got to go balls out you know like yeah. this is really happening and you know, it gets tiring, but um, I guess fast forward to this new record. Um, that was a benefit of coming to the table with the finished product because that way they were able to oh, give us yeah. money for videos. That's, you know what yeah. I mean? So they didn't have to pay for a record, but they're like, well, here's some money for some videos. And we're like, all right, cool. Now we're talking. So we did we did uh, one for the first song. We did like, I did like a little lyric video for the second. And then the third video for the, I guess you'd call the focus track um, of the new record. Um, I just saw the um, the early cuts of that yesterday. Actually, it's pretty cool. Pretty nice. cool. So we're uh, 
we were, um, and it was great too because the guys, the guys that do the coin, the production company out in Detroit, really cool dudes. Um, we were able to go to them and be like, "Look, we've got X amount of money, okay, and we want to shoot two videos. Can you do both of them for this?" So we were able to kind of maximize hmm. our money by going with the same people. And they were great to work with. And they were like, cool, it's going to come out. Nuclear blast. All right, that's good for them. And we're like, all right. So we went to um, Detroit and actually shot both of the performance parts of the video the same night. Okay. It was a long fucking night. But we saved money there. And uh, it was long and tiring, but uh, dirty, <laughs> really fucking dirty. But um, yeah, so that was a benefit of having a, you know, having a record done when you went to a yeah. record label. You know what I mean? Um, I, I advise it for, for a band. <laughs> for who, really for those who can do it, yeah. That's it's a finance I, yeah, you know, um, obviously putting out your record yourself is okay for some bands and it's cool. And at this point, you know, we've been around, so we kind of know how to do that stuff. And it's just a lot of work. So it's depending on how much fucking work you want to do, you know, if you really want to get your record out there. And uh, I'm kind of thankful I didn't, honestly, we, I didn't have to do all that because that would have been all on my shoulders. Yeah. And I wear a lot of hats already. So, um, but yeah, that was a benefit. Uh, one of the benefits. Cool, you know? yeah. That seems to parlay better for you guys. And um, I, there's now I have many questions to ask you, but I'm going to land on two. Hopefully I can remember the other one before, uh, okay. before you finish your answer that you're about to answer. How okay. beneficial is like a music video for like a hardcore band? Well, you know, that depends if you think you're a hardcore band or not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I get what you're saying. You know, there's a lot of people that hear us and they're like, they're a metal band. Yeah. You a know. band, uh, how beneficial is it for a band in the, the DIY scene, I should say? There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it gets, it, I think, I think it hit a low point at some point, but I think, I think now that people um, tend to not go a lot of places anymore, you mm -hmm. know, in, in general. I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, I, I, and frankly, I think, you know, the lockdown, the pandemic shutdown really did a number on people's collective psyche as far as interacting on a personal level. I mean, I just think um, you could probably prove that if you want, but just my overall feeling of it, just people don't like to go out anymore yeah. for some reason. You know what I mean? I think that's not crazy thing to say. So I think the music video has kind of had a little bit of resurgence um, because people can see you, you know, the comforts of their own cell phone, you know yeah. what I mean? And, um, I think more labels are, they seem to be willing to offer you more money to do that. And I think with, with the way social media is and YouTube, all the blow, stuff blowing up even bigger than it already is, um, they need that, that type of product out there. They need that visual product out there. So I think, I think it helps. Mm. And I, I certainly enjoy, I, I like making them because I'm a huge movie fan and I just like the process of making them. I think it's, it's really cool. Um, it's tricky too because music videos you could really make something really awesome and very you know artistic and yeah. gratifying and then it gets ruined because you've got to shove in a bunch of bunch of people playing guitars and singing and shit you know yeah. what i mean you can yeah, take yeah, a good yeah. stuff and then everyone's like well you're not even in it you know so then you got to cut out all this stuff to shoehorn the band in there mm. and but you people you know bands still find ways to make it interesting and if they got the loot, they sometimes they go really big with stuff with effects and all sorts of shit. And uh, you know, I certainly enjoy the good ones. There's some that are just made for just easy consumption, you know, and yeah. uh, and that's okay too. But I think I think they're a little bit more, I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, useful these days, I think. Yeah, um, definitely more beneficial because they the work content. for a while. Yeah, for I, I totally agree with you. I, I think um, around the time when I mean, you may look at it differently because of you know um, age and whatnot. But I'm 40, and or I'll be 40 next month. But you know, I did grow up on an MTV when they were playing you know music videos. Granted, they also incorporated some other kind of programming by the time I was right. like cognizant of MTV. But, mm -hmm. you know, I want to say that, like, toward the end there, you have Headbangers Ball, 120 Minutes, or, or you know, with, 
those things going yeah. on and then you start seeing more of a decline in music videos and that's probably because they weren't being shown on tv as often okay. and we didn't have the internet but i think even with the sure. internet uh like myspace and you know youtube and, and everything in the infancy they weren't really that big either but now that video content seems to be like the number one priority for a lot of outlets oh, social media and stuff like that it seems yeah. like all that stuff's coming back like in a resurgence and i'm here yeah. for it because i enjoy that aspect of you know the, the music. yeah you're 100 percent right i mean i mean everyone lives on TikTok or instagram or youtube so yeah. it's like you have to show something so these music videos are a way to do that you know um yeah you're right speaking of you brought TikTok up so i have to like ask i know a lot of content for like the hardcore metal world gets shared on these platforms and a mm -hmm. lot of the people that aren't really familiar with a lot of what goes on in our scene whether it be like moshing, stage diving, bands, you know, sounds that they're not used to. How do you think like social media in the last handful of years, you know, including pandemic and whatnot, has changed the landscape of like the metal and hardcore world? Well, and is it for better or worse? Well, you're also talking to a guy who's 51 who doesn't. <laughs> That's why I want to know, man. Well, you know, my perspective is a little different. I, I use those things, but not like, not like a lot of people. I don't live on those things. Right. Um, certainly use them and I look at them occasionally, but I don't stay on them for long, you know, because I think that, you know, it's just, I don't think people's brains are wired to consume thousands of mini images all day long. You know what I mean? I think it kind of rewires your brain. No, you yeah, think definitely adds stress. I think it, it's stress. It just, it, it just, you know, we could go into the psychology of that, but, um, that's a black hole, man. <laughs> yeah. It's a black hole that we don't have the time for that nor the expertise, but, um, you know, I, I mean, it's an important tool. Nonetheless, this is how people communicate. This is how they find out about things. This is where they, a lot of people get their ideas or formulate their opinions on stuff from watching this type of stuff. And, in lieu of actual physical or being there personally for mm -hmm. stuff, they get, you know, this is how information is exchanged these days for the most part. And that's, that could be good or bad. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a flip of a coin as yeah. far as you go there. But um, I'm not sure what the actual, the question was behind this, but I think uh, how, how has it, how has it changed the yeah. way people look at this genre? Or how's the, I mean, no, no. How's the landscape of the actual just scene changed with the, well, like the know, addition of I, that and people, newer people, younger people. Well, finding yeah, that. You know what? You could probably apply that to just about anything. Cause also, um, uh, you know, for, for all my, even before I started this band, well, a little bit before around the same time, uh, I've been a tattoo artist for 30 plus years. Um, that's, that's my bread and butter. So you can apply that same type of thing to tattoo culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be yeah, exactly. You could be um, a mediocre tattoo artist, or even a poor tattoo artist, because there's plenty of them. You know, there's plenty of great ones and plenty of shitty ones. Because that genre or that that career path or that uh, profession has exploded over since my time. And oh yeah, it's it's insane. You can't go to a bar or a barber shop and throw a nickel and not hit it. So when I tattoo, you know what I mean? So well, shit, you can go into a corporate office and most, most, if not half of the uh, people that work there sure. now are tattooed. Sure. You know? And that's, I mean, that's, that's good for business, but it's also <laughs> changes the business too. Yeah. But um, you could have, you could be a mediocre tattoo artist who is on your, on top of your game as far as social media goes. I mean, you could be like, you're not very good, but you know how to light your pictures, you know how to, put filters on them, you know, how to yeah. take the right videos, put the right songs, know the algorithms. And then actually, you know, you got 200,000 followers and that automatically makes you popular and mm -hmm. good, you know, and people want to get tattooed by you. Does that actually make you a good tattooer? Maybe, maybe yeah. not. Art is subjective you know? in that so matter, but you never know. That's like the type of thing, you know, a lot of people spend more time in a lot of professions um, working on their uh, socials, you know, making sure their socials are huge than actually doing the work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So a hundred percent. And th and that's for some coming from me who works, I work on everything about 20 hours a day. I only sleep four hours a day, you know? So, and my socials are 
just there. You know, I mean, I don't really, I don't, you know, I don't have the time to work on my socials because I'm too busy making stuff. Yeah. So sometimes that's gotten reversed. And I'm imagining that's probably the way it is um, with music too, extreme music. You know, if you can get a, you can get a viral clip out there on, you know, any of the platforms, you yeah. yourself a viral clip, a clip on, on TikTok, your band can be huge. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and, and you may not, you could be a great band, it, who knows, but you could also be a shitty band, but it doesn't matter. You become, you become, you know, popular. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if any of this is a good thing or, I mean, it certainly is, there's negative things to it when you talk about the whole, I guess the integrity of the music right. or, <laughs> right. you know, if it's actually good or not, you know, sometimes it don't even matter if it's good. If some people love shitty bands. Not know? true. Yeah. For one reason or another, they're big on they're They just find the right niche. They become, they go viral for whatever reason they become a thing. And you look back, you're like, they're not really a good band, you yeah. know, but they're fucking huge. And I guess good for them. That's cool. So I guess, how it's changed or how it's affected the, 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 the extreme or hardcore music scene. I think all that, all, all what I said, it kind of, you know, it is what it is now, you know, of course, I mean? yeah, there's no going back. The... There's no more, there's no more paper fanzines, you know, there's no more, you know, people like, you know, doing tape trading and stuff like yeah. that. That's, yeah. that's all gone, gone away. Yeah. And that's probably never coming back. You know, yeah. there's still people who hold on to that type of nostalgia, which is cool. Some people are still doing it, trying to keep it, keep it real. Yeah, I mean, they're but, making they're making tapes now for like newer bands, but like my question is, are they making tape players for these right. things to be yeah, played? Yeah, that it's, it's it's a novelty and it's cool, but where are you going to listen to that? At, yeah, you know, and, and if, if we're being serious, that's like the worst way to listen to like you know the band's yeah, music, like, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I'm going to put something out on a dead format that's not really sounds good. I mean, I suppose, though, if you put, like, black metal bands on cassette tape, it would sound awesome because that's how they should sound. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. It would sound like they were made out of boombox. Yeah. You know, that's the good stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I like some of those cassette tapes. They're pretty cool. I rarely buy any if I see them. I've got, I've got drawers full of about a 1,000 of them in the other room. Yeah, you know? from your old collection when you were using oh, them yeah, as sure. tapes, as tape you players. Know, I've got, I've got about, you know, 400 VHS tapes, and I mean, what do you want? I got oh, laser Lord. discs, I got all that shit. She's always laser discs. Um, yeah, no, I asked the, the social media question and, like, the newer, because, you know, like, it definitely, I think a lot of younger bands and people, some people in general think, like, Twitter or your streams on Spotify or all this other, like, notoriety you get from online, whether it's followers or comments, whatever, that equates to real world stuff when in reality, you know, a lot of bands that might be super popular and they might have, you know, thousands, if not millions of streams, or, you know, they may have like large followings. They play like big festivals and they do really well on the festival type circuit. But if they were to like have to, you know, headline clubs right. or s small venues, there. you know, that's when you really start seeing like the true, the trueness of like your following when, when you can pull those bands out just by yourself and not be on like a day long fest with 80 other bands that are pulling in sure. you know, thousands. I mean, that's like, yeah, sure. Anyone looks great when they're playing in front of 50,000 people, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's, it's strange too. And, and this is this, you know, I've seen bands that do really well. They could, they they got the moves. They know what to say to large audiences. You know, and there's like an ocean of people. They could really work it, and they could they they're great. They got the whole thing. But if you put them in front of a small crowd, <clears throat> they don't know how to interact with a, on a one on one level, right. or a personal, more even if, when I say small, even if it's like a thousand or five hundred or maybe even two hundred, you know, or less, they have a really tough time translating what their music their music to a smaller audience. And that's a kind of a telling thing to me somewhat, you know what I mean? If you, you know, granted, I've never had the opportunity to do the other side, you know, <laughs> play in front of millions of people, but I certainly would like to. Um, Take that festival organizers. We certainly have experience playing in front of small crowds. So, and it just becomes a personal experience somewhat. And that's, that keeps you honest as a music, as a musician or a performer, I think, you know, when you, you when you're singing or you're playing and you could actually look out in the crowd and just look at someone and they're you know they're you know what i mean you kind yeah, of make eye contact because there's 
there's only four people in the place, you know, <laughs> but, but you know Very what I'm saying? Like, and then, you know, when you, when you get, we've played some bigger shows, but you know, when there's that many people, they just become a thing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's not, you lose, lose like a personal connection. And I see a lot of bands that are, that do those fests that, on smaller venues, it's it's very awkward. You know what I mean? Like all this, all the kind of rehearsed stuff you would say to a large crowd doesn't work when there's only right. twenty people. Yeah. So find your, they find themselves in weird positions sometimes. Um, but you know, I guess if you never don't, if you don't have to worry about that, then that's okay too. Yeah. Know? I get stuck in this weird limbo to where like I do enjoy going to these festival type situations and seeing you know massive amounts of bands and this or the other and obviously like those festivals may attract bands that may not come to our area frequently or something like that but i also have this like really nagging feeling that festivals are killing smaller shows in smaller clubs sometimes because now bands don't focus on playing those types of venues or writing music for those types of venues they want to shift gears to how can we land on festival x or y you know and yeah. it's um I hope I'm completely wrong, right? Like, I hope that I'm wrong, but no, part of I me mean, thinks well, that I mean, it has a cause and effect there, to it. There has been, um, just, you know, judging from where I've come from and see stuff, you know, there's definitely been a shift because there's, the the, the tracks are laid right now. Is the groundwork or the patterns that you need to do to get to a certain level are right there. You, there's, there's almost instructions on what you need to do to get to that level. Right. Whether you make it or not is one thing, but... You know, when I started the band, there was no intentions of doing any of that. We were just having fun and playing music and playing shows. There was no bands often get together now with the intention of being that. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely I, how I something's that, changed over the course of the time. And I don't see that as a bad thing because you, as a band, you want to be successful. You want to be Kiss. You know, we wanted to be Kiss too, but you know, in reality, we were just you know five guys making music and having fun. But now there's there's you know with with social media and. You know, we got back to the, you know, the TikToks and the your viral videos and your stage production and, you know, all this stuff. It's, you know, that that template is laid out for a lot of bands to go directly for the goal, you know, and do whatever it takes to get that. So I don't know if that makes you, a, a, you know, and plus you, you have to compromise your sound. You, you, you're almost in a pigeonhole because you need to make you need to make music that appeals to the most people. Yeah. That 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 is very helpful. That's one thing that we kind of fall on the downside of. And <laughs> granted, there's probably a lot more people that will like us now that they could hear us. You know, I'm not degrading our music at all, but I think you know what I mean. There's, yeah, you're not changing your you're not changing the corner. Yeah, of the band. You know, we're not we're not starting a band like let's do a band like this because yeah. that's what everyone's listening to. We just uh, let's do do a band. Um. But yeah, I mean, that's also, you know, you have to kind of change with the change with the environment if you want to stay at certain levels. So, but again, all that is okay. You know what I mean? It's all whatever people want to do. I never really diss anybody, you know? I got you. Yeah. I mean, if if we were sitting down having a beer or whatever, and we talk about, well, what do you think about this? I'd be like, well, I think this, you know, but I never, I never found um, any reason to just go out and rip on anything you yeah. know what i mean no i get it 100 percent because like there's you know even at running lamb goat like there's a horde yeah. of bands right that i don't care for or i don't understand or I, it's not for me one way or the other right that's not yeah. to say i'm not we're not going to cover them or post about them you know like our job is to inform the scene of our you know the industry and the scene about well, i'm sure i don't on. need to inform you that <laughs> let's go <laughs> the lamb goat message board is um made for dissing everything yeah so that's that's it's but i often have you spent you know, some time tell, on there have you spent some time I, on there, I often tell people and i've been guilty of it too they're like you know you put something new out and was like just don't go to lamb go dude those if if you, unless you have a very strong fucking confidence in what you do don't go there because people just say the fucking most ridiculous shit yeah I find it it's pretty funny sometimes, you know. Well, I so. think I think and you come but again, you come from a different time and a different culture yeah. and stuff like that, but like you know, Lamb Cook came around and like bands were dissing on bands within the comments and the message board. Like they were they're fans of the band dissing on the band. It's sure. granted, yes, there might be a, you know, an average uh neck beard somewhere that's just in the mom's basement just wanting to troll and just be a right. shithead anyway. I'm not saying there's not, but 
you know, the the culture comes from bands shitting on other bands because they like sure, each other. Balls. Yeah, it was just a camaraderie thing. And Lamb Goat wasn't ever really supposed to get out into the mainstream, quote unquote, world. And it is, but the culture for Lamb Goat, especially those who have been visiting for a long time, it's remained the same. So that's where the right. two worlds cl- <laughs> clash and collide. Sure. Yeah, um, I mean, I, like I said, I don't... Uh... And I've been guilty of reading it too, reading reviews. <laughs> I'm just like, oh man. And I find, you know, it's it's funny. I don't, uh, you know. You know, art is subjective, though, James. And you guys have been running for almost thirty years. So either either you're doing it right, and whoever reviewed the album is wrong, or whatever. But you know, it's all subjective, man. And uh, yeah, you guys I have know, made I, a long I, career. We don't. If we really cared about, you know, if we really cared about. When other people thought we probably would have quit after the first record. Yeah, and you know? I want to say I want to say as far as like bands that we've covered over the I mean it's, we're getting, we're going into our twenty fifth year right so like you guys have almost been right alongside or we've almost been right alongside for most of your you know your musical career uh, and that's just you know it's it's great that we can offer that and like you can look back if you wanted to. You know, yeah. not the comments, but you can look back on Lamb Goat and look at like tours you've done in like the early two thousands. Yeah, stuff sure. like that. Oh yeah, so. yeah. No, it's cool. We appreciate. I mean, we appreciate that. I'm not saying you don't. I'm just clarifying for the listeners. Yeah, right on, right on. <laughs> All right, I have a couple more questions left, but I'm going to go with two because we're, we're running okay. we're running almost to an hour. Okay. You guys have been around for you know, like I said, a long, long time. We have. We've said that's about twenty times. Yeah, legendary <laughs> ringworm. The Le- legendary classic. band, classic legendary classic. band. <laughs> I say that because, like, I want to know, like, is the current, the current, um, is this the current final form of Ringworm, or how, how many, like, it will it always evolve? Well, as far as musically, yeah, like your direction, um, you like know, where you want to go. This is the way I look at it. Like everybody in, in, in the band does other bands. I mean, I'm in a band called Gluttons, and we kind of I play guitar in that, sing a little bit, but mostly play guitar. That's more of like a straightforward, like hard rock, like Motorhead thing. Okay. And our singer sings kind of doesn't doesn't do what I do. It's more of like a straight up rock and roll band. Uh, Matt has his other outlets, and Ed has his other outlets. He's in numerous bands. Um, so with Ringworm, I think we've always made made it. The, the intention of all of us either we're either we're doing that well it all starts with matt it all starts with matt because he creates the music i have very little input on that maybe some song structures mm. or how many times you do a part but that's about it matt it starts with matt and matt matt is very um he's he's not i don't want to call him an elitist but he's um He's got a vision, like he knows the type of songs he wants to write, so he's not going to be writing any ballads anytime soon. So it starts there. But in the grand scheme of things, we like to keep, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but occasionally we'll reinvent our own wheel a little bit. Yeah. And keep, I mean, there's certain bands, and I like to think we're one of them, that you know what you're going to get. You know, like when you hear Motorhead, you know what Motorhead's going to sound like. You know, you hear Bolt Thrower. You know what Bolt Thrower is yeah. going to sound. Mm-hmm. ACDC, Napalm Death. You know exactly what you're going to get, and you find comfort in that. You know what I mean? It's like comfort food a little bit, you know? And uh, we like to keep it internally like that, too, because if we want to do other stuff, we can go do it and still keep Ringworm what it exactly. is. I mean, at this point, there's no there's no reason for us to do a techno record, you know, or... You know what I'm saying? There's no reason for us to do it, do that. Why would we do that? Yeah. So, especially when we're so good at what we do right now. You know what I mean? So Agreed. we just we just keep fucking doing what we do, and and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, the more and more we do it, you know, a few more people get to hear it, and they're like, oh wow. And it, we're actually at the stage right now where people, younger people, will hear us that have may not have heard us before, and that you know they'll be like oh well they sound like these guys like those guys sound like us yeah. fucking two years yeah i think they kind of sound like us yeah. you know so you know um but yeah we, we, i think this is i mean what you hear from us is what you're gonna hear from roughly us. roughly more of the same not in a bad way but just you know no not same. in a bad way yeah. at all i mean you know there's always a demand for you know um honest heavy music that kind of punches you in the fucking face and 
you know. No, I agree. There's nothing like there's nothing worse than a band you you really like, and then they have another album come out and they're trying something new, and you're like, oh boy, that's not. Well, my you know thing. what? Like, but this also goes back back to the same thing too. It's like, I, you know. Not that I don't appreciate when bands change. Sometimes they do it for the better and they change their sound and it's cool and they just want to experiment with stuff and that's cool. I don't have much range. You know, what what you know, even if he came to the table with something completely different, I'll be like, what am I supposed to do over that? You know, am I supposed to sing over that? You know, I can't do that. You know, at least not I'm not gonna try it in this band. Yeah. You know, so like I said, we're we're you know, I'll be the first to say that we're kind of a one trick pony. But it's a fucking really good trick. Yeah. It's a really good trick that you don't mind seeing all the time. You know? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time, James. AKA the don't, you have, don't you have a second question? I did, but you question. answered it in, you answered it in that, see? In that, Very in that explanation. In that no, I know. And I don't have to answer it. But all right. I do hope that we get a, another twenty ringworm albums before everything yeah. is said and done. I I hope you guys maintain along the longevity um you know i think it's really important that some of these and don't hate me legacy type bands from back in the day continue on uh for the diy community and just for like you know reference for for back then i mean it's it's great that you guys are still bringing it for this long and uh like you said earlier things happen especially covid where bands don't succeed or don't last you know yeah and it is a testament you know, when when I use the word legacy band or legendary band in this in this you know realm, it's a testament because like it is beyond difficult to remain active in this you know genre, in these genres more than oh, yeah. people think. I mean, there's a lot of people that are that you know metal and hardcore is their life and they're a fan, and to them their band like they they look at the bands on stage and they're as big as Kiss or as big as other bands that are you know shit, rocking arenas but in reality mm-hmm. it's far from that you know what i mean and oh, you, yeah. you have your their their the way they see their the favorite bands is a little skewed so kudos to you guys for just you know oh, running through walls and continuing you know well, it, you know it gets, it, as as i'll just throw this in there real quick as odd as it seems it's like the, for us the older that we get the the more that we feel the need to go even harder because yeah. there's nothing worse when you it, it, feeling that like if someone's like man i heard about this band ringworm i really want to go see him and then they go see us and we're just a bunch of old tired guys yes, you know yeah. what I mean? so we go out of our way we go 180 degrees to not do that mm. so as we keep putting as we get older and put more records out we try to keep going harder and more aggressive and just pushing the envelope more and more and more so that's kind of what you're seeing because you know there there's nothing worse than just having your expectations let down, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And when it gets to that when we can't when it gets to the point where we can't perform at a certain level, then we'll just be like, all right, that was a great run, you know? Yeah. But right now there's really no little shit, like I said, we'll have to drop dead before that. Yeah. And again, you know, hardcore and all this other shit just kinda of basically turned forty. So you know, I'm hoping that you guys are still on stage at 70. I hope, you know, and that, cause we'll that doesn't seem, that seemed far fetched probably when you were a youngster. I, I understand. But now that we're here, it doesn't seem like that far fetched. You know, you have more years behind you than you, uh, more years in a band behind you than it would well, take you know to get what? to 70. Like, so. um, you know, negative approach are still rocking. Yeah. And, you know, and they've been doing it a lot longer than we have and they still kill it live. So, yeah. you know, Someone's got to teach these young ones, man. Someone's got to teach these young cats, you know? So hopefully you guys are stick stick around and and school them up, you know? That's right. All right, James. I appreciate your time today, brother. And if you're still listening to us, uh, definitely go go listen to uh, Seeing Through Fire, which is out on uh, Nuclear Blast now as the podcast is out. Do you want to shout out your uh, tattoo stuff? I don't know if you want to. Sure, man. Okay. You could, uh, you could uh, 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 go check out 252 Tattoo on like the Instagrams and stuff like that, or James Bullock, or Human Furnace on on, uh, on like the Instagram stuff like that. Like, you try to keep that as updated as possible with ringworm stuff and my art stuff and all that type of bullshit. So, um, yeah, you can find us out there. We're out there. Cool. And yeah, if okay, one more question. If a new sure. if a younger kid came to you and was yeah. like, How do I get in how do I get into Ringworm? What's the one album that you're referencing, that kid? Well, I would my I would just tell him to, to listen to my favorite of our records, uh, which is Venomous Grand Design. 
Awesome. Awesome. Um, that's that's a sleeper record for me. Um, yeah, that's just my favorite record of ours. But um, I think most people would probably tell them to pick up one of the first three if you wanted to start here. <laughs> But you know, we, we like I said, we've we've changed since the get go. We've got you know we've become better musicians, you know, mm-hmm. over the past thirty years, and so you have a little bit more tools in your toolbox to make music and able to explore more of our influences that we we have in a better way. But uh, you know, maybe Justice Replaced by Revenge might be a good jumping point because that's kind of like where we took a turn for a little bit more metal sound. Yeah. So in that yeah. in that two year span of like that Victory Records time yeah. mid 2000s all right so you heard it thanks for not here. talking about the victory record years because we would have been talking about tony brummel for like two hours you know i uh i'm not gonna lie to you there james i thought about it but i've also talked about it already on like the last sure two or three no, like every day that's been on them two or three yeah the two or three podcasts before here we've all we've already that's brought fine. it up I so appreciate that. yeah <laughs> all right james thanks a lot for coming on the show today man and i, I hope to see right, you man, soon. i appreciate it man i'll talk to you take it easy brother Later.